Hi, I'm Tracy, VE3TWM. Thank you for tuning in to Outdoors on the Air. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, I found myself working from home every weekday, as opposed to making the one-hour commute to the office and back on a daily basis. Since my basement home office is where my ham shack is set up, I was able to start listening to ham radio while toiling away. As you might guess, I found this to be a wonderful silver lining to the dark COVID cloud. The wire antenna I had up for HF gave me the chance to listen to regional 80 meter and 40 meter nets, but I had a very compromised antenna system for VHF and UHF. This was a shame as I had two very nice Yesu rigs sitting right there waiting to be pressed into service. I made the decision that after 10 years in this home, it was time to put up a tower and get myself a decent VHF UHF station. I selected a tower installer and set up a date. Now that I knew the tower was going up, it was time to choose a dual band antenna. I decided I wanted a vertical and focused my attention on the Diamond and Comet brands. I started looking at verticals in the lower end of the range, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized this would probably be my last tower as I am approaching retirement age. Rather than put up an entry-level antenna now and come to regret that decision in a few years, why not spend a bit more and put up a high-performance antenna and be done with it. So that is the direction I headed off in. The antenna I wanted was the Diamond X510, a 17 foot tall monster, but the local ham radio reseller had been out of that model for a while and there was no firm word on when they would get stock. With a tower installation date looming, I opted to switch brands and go to the competing Comet model, the GP9. The GP9 had very good reviews on eham.net, so I felt confident with my choice. Let's take a look at the GP9's specifications. First, on the physical side, this is a tall vertical. The GP9 is almost 17 feet tall at 16 feet 9 inches. It's a collinear design that Comet describes as a high gain antenna with a narrow elevation angle. In practical terms, if you were to install this antenna on a hilltop, you might have difficulty hearing those at the bottom of the hill due to the tight beam width. My location is not on a hilltop, so I was willing to make that compromise. The stated gain figures for the GP9 are 8.5 dBi on 2 meters and 11.9 dBi on 440. On 2, the antenna is 3 5 8 waves, and on 440, 8 5 8 waves. The power rating is 200 watts single sideband and 100 watts FM. SWR across the 2 meter band is given as less than 1.5 to 1 across the entire band, and less than 1.5 to 1 from 442 to 450 megahertz. The assembled antenna is fairly light and easy to handle at 5 pounds 11 ounces. I opted for the model with the SO239 connector after doing much reading into the differences in signal loss between PL259 and N connectors at 70 centimeters. Though many people swear by the use of N connectors for VHF and UHF, what I learned through my research is that the difference was going to be negligible for my station where I planned to work primarily FM with a coax cable length of 68 feet using LMR 400. The wire radiator is protected by a white fiberglass shell which is shipped in three sections. These sections are joined by ABS connectors, a departure from the metal joints used by Diamond on their tall verticals. The anecdotal reviews I read in regard to this difference indicated that the ABS joints utilized by Comet are less likely to allow for the ingress of water. Speaking of water ingress, 
I discovered while looking into these tall verticals that there are two major potential problem areas with them that develop over time. The first is water getting into the places where the vertical sections connect, and the second is cold solder joints at the base of the antenna. Most concerning to me is the cold solder joint issue. Let me relate a story I encountered after I had my GP9 installed. A ham here in southern Ontario recently purchased the same model. When he deployed the antenna, the SWR was not good on both 2 meters and 70 centimeters. He pulled the antenna down off the tower and discovered a cold solder joint at the base. He took the antenna back to where he had purchased it, the largest reseller of ham radio gear in Canada. The person he spoke with proceeded to tell him the issue was his fault and there was no warranty coverage. In my estimation, if what this ham told me was accurate, this is terrible customer service, both from the reseller and the manufacturer. Now back to the GP9 and my installation. As previously mentioned, the vertical radiator is in three pieces. Also in the package are three short radials, the mounting bracket and supporting hardware. While reading through the eHAM reviews, I became concerned over the apparent difficulty some hams had while assembling the GP9. The three vertical sections are joined together first by connecting the radiator wires, then the ABS screw-in connections for the fiberglass outer shell. Some of the reviewers experienced problems while pulling the recessed radiator wires out of the fiberglass shell far enough to expose the ends and make the two screw connections. I took my time, was very careful, and had no problems whatsoever. A quick note on the tiny screws used to join the radiator sections. Take great care not to lose these. They are very small and may be a non-standard size you'll have difficulty replacing if lost. I kept mine in an old pill bottle until it was time to put the antenna together. Once the radiator sections are joined, screwing the ABS joints together was easy. Taking into consideration the GP9's susceptibility to water penetration, I took extra precautions to try and keep the rain out. First, I wrapped the entire ABS joint with coax seal. Then I wrapped over that with high quality scotch electrical tape. This is recommended as coax seal will break down over time due to UV radiation. The electrical tape shields the coax seal from those harmful UV rays. When I connected the LMR400 coax to the SO239 at the base of the GP9, even though the entire connection is covered with a clever sheath to keep water out, I repeated the process used with the vertical section joints by first applying coax seal, then electrical tape just for insurance. If I had to do that part again, I would first use the electrical tape then coax seal, then more electrical tape over top. The reason for that is that coax seal is difficult to remove. If I ever need to change out the coax, putting electrical tape underneath the coax seal would have made it easier to get off. The next step in getting the antenna ready was to test the SWR on the ground. I did not want to get the GP9 up into the air on the tower only to learn there was a problem with it. I pulled out my Yesu FT897D and tested first on 2 meters, then on 440. To my delight, the SWR was well below 1.5 to 1 from 144 to 148 and from 430 to 450 megahertz. The final step in getting the antenna ready to raise was to paint the white fiberglass with a flat black paint. I did this to decrease the neighborhood profile. With the tower installed and the antenna sitting proudly on top, it was time to see how it worked. Another test of the SWR, this time with the antenna perched up high, showed me the same result as I had seen on the ground. The SWR was below 1.5 to 1 across all of 2 meters, and the same from 430 MHz to 450 MHz. 
I was in business. I started to monitor 146.520 MHz, the 2-meter FM simplex call channel. The first thing I noticed was that the channel, while not continually busy, had a lot more traffic on it than I was expecting. And that was just from local hams. Over time, I began to hear more distant stations. There is an active group of hams across the border in the Buffalo region, and I could hear some of them on Simplex. This was amazing to me. One day, I was able to make a contact with Matt over in Amherst, New York. That's a distance of 55 miles. Matt gave me a good signal report, and I was thrilled. I really didn't expect to be able to work across the border via FM Simplex, but my station was up to the task. Turns out Matt's station was not all that different from mine in terms of tower height and antenna. For the purpose of this video, I asked Matt for a follow-up contact on 52. Here's how it went. Kilo 2, Echo Alpha Golf. This is Victor Echo 3, Tango Whiskey Mike. Hey, doing fine, Matt. How about yourself? Uh, excellent. Uh, we're we're giving you about an S5. Uh, very good signal here into Eggersville, which is uh, based to the northeast corner of the city of Buffalo. Uh, I looked this up. We're about 50, almost 59 miles. Matt, would you mind uh, telling me what you're running for a station there, please? What, uh, what make and brand is that collinear you're running? Now that's the really big, that, that's the high-end diamond dual band vertical, isn't it? Yeah, okay, Matt. Matt, there was another station in there who was a bit noisy. Uh, do you want to ask him to go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, K2, the EAG here. Uh, um, pass it over to Ross. Maybe the IN to pick it up. Uh, Tracy, is uh, Tracy is in Burlington, Ontario. Yeah, hi, Tracy. Hi, Matt. Yeah, I'm Ross, R-O-S-S. -S. I am in Kenmar. Fantastic, Ross. What are you running for a station there? Uh, I'm using a fiberglass collinear and a Motorola Maritrack. And how much power are you pumping out? Mm, putting out about, uh, I don't know, about 40 watts, I think, right now. Okay, and what would your, uh, how high up would your antenna be? Not very high at all. It's at about uh, 30 feet. So to wrap up this review, my Comet GP9 is working very well. It did not replace a previously installed antenna at the same height, so I can't compare it to a different model. But I can tell you I am really pleased with its performance. I have good simplex range, and of course have no trouble hitting most repeaters within a 50 mile radius, as long as they are in the directions open to me. Would I recommend the Comet GP9? If I did not speak to someone who had a recent unpleasant experience, as I noted earlier, yes, absolutely. But because I did hear of that ham's unfortunate situation, I can only offer a guarded recommendation. If you are looking for a high-performance, dual-band, 
2 meter 70 centimeter vertical. The Comet GP9 is a solid choice. But if I were you, I'd probably ask whoever sells it to you to check for cold solder joints before you walk out the door with it. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please feel free to leave your comments below. I read them all and respond to as many as I can. Until next time, get out of the shack, get outdoors and get on the air. 73 from Tracy, VE3, TWM.